This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From custom domains to beautiful websites using their easily customizable templates that you can have up and running in minutes, e-commerce, email and email marketing, SEO, analytics, and scheduling, Squarespace does it all and has done it for us for the last six years. If you are a small to mid-sized business in any industry, Squarespace is the place to go for all of your website needs. Hop over to www.squarespace.com slash you for a free trial. And if you like what you see and want to move forward, receive 10% off your first order by using the discount code Hugh at checkout. Thanks, Squarespace. Just about two and a half years ago, having already tested and been blown away by the original GFX 100, best image quality I'd ever seen in terms of resolution, tonality, gradation, and dynamic range, best autofocus of any medium format camera I'd ever seen, a shutter release to die for, really. It just may be the best in the business. And on top of that, plus a whole bunch of other things, including 4K 60p video, unheard of on a medium format camera at the time, and optional, tiltable, EVF OMG. I called the then new, 40% less expensive, far smaller and lighter GFX 100S, the most accessibly performant digital medium format camera on the planet. I'll put a link to that review in the show notes down below. And that was that until now, because the GFX 100 Mark II wrapped in a new body is even better. Although closing in on 50% more expensive and marginally bigger and heavier than the 100S, if still 25% less expensive and a whopping 32% lighter than the original. But is that all there is to this story? Of course not. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and I will just cut to the chase. One. As was the case with the original GFX 100 and the subsequent GFX 100 S, the imagery coming out of the GFX 100 Mark II is gorgeous. Best I've ever had in hand, save for Hasselblad's newer X2D 100 C, which exceeds the Fujifilm with the most beautiful colors straight out of camera, as far as I'm concerned, and it is subjective in the business. Although the Fujifilm colors are lovely as well. like the new body, and I applaud Fujifilm not only for the industrial design improvements, but for the reintroduction of the EVF tilt adapter, which I find an incredibly useful tool for unobtrusive shooting on the street and getting, literally, a different angle on things. I love it. While we're at it, I also love the upgraded 9.44 million dot 0.64 inch 1x magnification EVF itself. This is a pinnacle EVF. I also love being able to set the command dial so that when shooting the exposure triangle, all I have to do to switch it from aperture to ISO is push it in and then spool it up or down. This makes the GFX 100 Mark II the fastest digital medium format camera I have ever used for the way I shoot, which is to say, dialing in the exposure triangle from shot to shot manually. Although, fair enough. The rightmost of the new top three function buttons on the camera's grip just behind the shutter release straight from the factory is also set to toggle ISO, but that requires engaging another finger, which is unnecessary the way I've set up the command dial. And again, while we're at it, I appreciate the straight out of the box assignment of face eye detect on off to the leftmost of those top three function buttons 
and I like setting the middle button to auto focus mode. Although, what I'd really like is to be able to set this to a single, that is a particular autofocus mode of my choosing. As in my experience, I like to shoot with face IAF in wide mode or a single center point useful for quick focus and recompose. This serves my needs well. I'd say these physical controls and setup are second only to Panasonic's Lumix series for quick changes to autofocus. Although in practice, even with IAF face detection on, the GFX100 Mark II did not always lock onto a face clearly in frame, not nearly as performant as the autofocus of our full frame A7R5, which I do regard as the best in the business for most people most of the time. All in all, I think the new body is a terrific advance, although I'd challenge Fujifilm to somehow figure out how to make it significantly lighter. Hold that thought. Three, the new $2,300 GF55 1.7 is a beautiful lens with relatively fast and quiet autofocus, although the best full frame lenses are faster and sure, smaller and lighter. Still at the full frame field of view and shallow step the field equivalent of a 44 millimeter F1.4, I'd call it the standard lens to get, the only lens to get for the GFX100 Mark II if you can have only one. I should add, though, that the, what, $1,200 GF30 3.5 is a wonderful lens on the GFX100 Mark II as well. But with all of this said, for no matter what the specs imply and what some corners of YouTube assert, and as I've already suggested, this medium format camera is not as good a hybrid in my book as the best full frame hybrids out there. There are better trade-offs. As I just mentioned, the autofocus is not as good, but the video is not as good either. The cooling is not as good, and it is a lot bigger, heavier, and more expensive with a narrower range of lens options, with each lens adding incrementally more size and weight to a kit relative to the best full-frame counterparts. Five, I wouldn't use the Mark II for video, even with the now full-sized HDMI port, yay, because other full-frame choices out there make more sense for what we do, particularly Panasonic's Lumix S5 II and Sony's A7R5, and we own both of them. We've made the S5 II our go-to for video with three of them as the foundation for our interview kit because of its utterly reliable, no futz, built-in active cooling and surprisingly good autofocus, its relatively small size, lightweight, keen price, the small, lightweight, highly performed for 4K video, Lumix S line of 67 millimeter filter thread F1.8 primes, and the ease with which I can set all cameras identically through a profile I set once to a card and then load to the other two. Although, right, this is not the only camera capable of this particular party trick. Our A7R5, on the other hand, is the one camera body we bring when we can bring only one with the intention of shooting stills and video, want the most resolution, best autofocus, and widest and highest performing array of focal lengths possible, while packing small and light enough not to have our roller checked as baggage, although Lufthansa is too picky for us. This is when we'll bring the 24-70 and 70-200 Mark II zooms and 35-1.4 G Masters with us. Six, I am quite uncertain about what makes the new sensor of the GFX100 Mark II usefully new. Yeah, yeah, a maximum of 8 frames per second using the mechanical shutter versus 5 in the S, 5 frames per second versus 2.9 frames per second electronic shutter versus the S, 1 32,000th of a second versus 1 16,000th of a second, bigger, faster buffer, the lowest ISO of 80 instead of 100, blah -de blah 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 I'm not sure that any of this really matters, nor am I sure that somewhere between most and all of that doesn't come from the latest fifth generation X processor found in the X-T5 and X-H2 series now inside the Mark II. Although I don't actually care. None of these advances constitute a material difference to how we shoot on the street. Although the longer battery life from the same battery is a good thing. Especially when, once again, we have the option of smaller, lighter, faster, full-frame alternatives. Are you willing to give up the resolution for those things? Most of the time, I am.
Of course, that's just us. Your mileage may vary, and as always, that's fine. Thus far, there is nothing that makes me think, however, that in the medium format space, I'd be giving up much of anything from an image quality perspective by buying a used GFX 100S in like new minus condition for 4200 bucks on KEH. And even though the Mark II has that X processor 5, there just isn't anything that bothered me that much about the GFX 100S that out in the real world, I feel the GFX 100 Mark II does that much better now. Save for that EVF with tilt adapter, which, say it with me now, is awesome. Finally, seven. The menu and touch systems now really bother me. This is not the first time I've said this. It's not the first time I've said it about cameras generally, but this is fair enough more the bane of a YouTuber's existence than someone who isn't a YouTuber and would simply take the time to learn the one and only system he or she would have to know. Still, the entire industry, I think, save for Leica and Hasselblad, really need to rethink the entire user experience in the era of highly performant smartphones. All of which leads us where precisely? For now, let me summarize it this way. 1. The GFX100 Mark II is the new benchmark in the medium format segment. Fujifilm has figured out how to keep just about everything from the original GFX100 except the extra batteries and make it better while also making it smaller, lighter, and less expensive. This is an extraordinary feat and straight up demands respect. Fujifilm. Guys, kudos. 2. With this said... Hasselblad has not stood still. More importantly, the full-frame market has not stood still. And this segment, broadly considered, is much more competitive than when I first got my hands on the original GFX four and a half years ago. Thus, three. If you loved the original GFX 100, including the resolution and the optional EVF tilt adapter, but found it just out of reach financially and or operationally, that is, just too expensive or big and heavy to schlep all over, or you weren't satisfied with the autofocus performance, well, the GFX100 Mark II is the camera you've been waiting for. Buy it. Period. The cost, size, and weight savings over the original will be good for a premium economy ticket to just about anywhere in the world, and if you buy it, then you'll probably have the inclination and wherewithal to carry it with you just about anywhere in the world, too. There is a fringe benefit. The build quality of the Mark II is better than both of its older siblings. 4. But if you were already enthralled by the GFX 100S and couldn't afford its $6,000 price tag, currently selling as low as $5,200 new on B&H, you may want to use the arrival of the GFX 100 Mark II to pick up a like new minus GFX 100S for a thousand less than that, $4,200 as I said moments ago at KEH. The added bonus here, the 100S is marginally smaller and lighter than the Mark II as well. 5. If you want the resolution of the GX100 series in a smaller, lighter body with the best color science in the business, the best menu system in the business, the best touch interface in the business, arguably better industrial design, inarguably even better build quality, don't need the tiltable EVF and can make do with Leisurely, unsophisticated autofocus performance, you may want to take a very close look at Hasselblad's 8200 X2D100C. It's gorgeous, it's not much more expensive than the GFX100 Mark II, and it does have its own rewards. Although at the moment one could argue, and I'd likely agree with you, that given Hasselblad's slow revamp of the XCD lens line to their new V-series, uh, Fujifilm has a wider and deeper lens line than Hasselblad, often as or more performant taken in toto. 6. Make sure you really do need or want that full 100 megapixels worth of resolution, because if you don't, I take a very close look at Sony's Okay, not as much fun. $3,800 60 megapixel interchangeable lens A7R5 or Leica's 28 millimeter f1.7 fixed lens $6,000 Q3. Both of them are much smaller, lighter, faster, surer to autofocus, and less expensive than the GFX100 Mark II, and both will, for 99% of us much of the time, anyway, especially outside of the studio, extract more out of their 60 megapixels than the GFX100 Mark II will from its 100 megapixels, which 
is a bit of a paradox. I think the best and highest use of the GFX 100 series is still in the studio because of its size and weight and resolution. Although Fujifilm has been doing its best to shrink it down and make it an untethered camera with, among other things, excellent IBIS. It's just a little bit too big and too heavy to really have it out on the street for what we do. Seven, if you don't need autofocus, video, IBIS, or once again, 100 megapixels, I'd say take a close look at Leica's 60 megapixel M11 rangefinder series. They are even more expensive than the GFX 100 Mark II, yes, and that expense only increases with each lens you buy, but in comparison, both they and their lenses are tiny, light, and can be enormously satisfying. Finally, eight, if, however, irrespective of format, what you want is one camera to do it all, stills, video, autofocus, and manual. You want that maximum resolution. You don't mind the size, weight, autofocus, performance, or cost of the GFX 100 Mark II, especially as you add glass compared to full frame. And let me repeat, absolutely want the highest stills resolution possible without resorting to pixel shifting because you know pixel shifting rarely works well outside of the studio. If you've calculated that the total volume and cost and weight of a GFX 100 Mark II kit when you travel will be less than, say, two different full-frame systems, one for stills, one for video. And you don't need the absolute highest resolution, best video performance, or thermal management, raw recording out on the Mark II notwithstanding. Then, for now, go for it. The GFX 100 Mark II is the best game in town. Me personally, if I didn't have the systems I already have and could wrap my head around schlepping that size and weight hours each day on the street, and I sorted the autofocus settings a bit more than I have thus far. Of the two GFX 100 systems now available, the original is listed as discontinued, I'd opt for the Mark II for the tiltable EVF alone. I think it's that good. And from where I sit, the irony, the surprise, is that this is the single greatest difference for what I do compared to the GFX 100S. Although now that I'm thinking about it, I could buy, you could buy, if I didn't already have one, if you don't already have one, a like new minus 47 and a half megapixel Leica SL2 for 3,800 bucks, and then buy a used Apo Sumicron SL35 F2, holy smokes, for 3,255 to go with it, again on KEH. While it wouldn't have an articulating EVF or rear panel, I prefer both. Only a 5.7 million dot EVF at that. Okay. No hybrid face detection autofocus. Only half the megapixels. It still would be one heck of a setup. Smaller and lighter too. Best build quality of all. Best industrial design of all. With an even better lens and menu system for less than the price of the GFX 100 Mark II body alone. And it does 4K video as well. Or, if I didn't care about ergos or menu systems, and I didn't already have one, I'd spend more and build an even more functional, performant, more broadly useful system around Sony's A7R5. Although, none of these options would give me what I need for our three camera shoots remotely as inexpensively or as well as our current S5 II kit, and none of the non-medium format options would provide quite as rich a stills image as the GFX100 Mark II. Just saying. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From custom domains to beautiful websites using their easily customizable templates that you can have up and running in minutes, e-commerce, email and email marketing, SEO, analytics and scheduling, Squarespace does it all and has done it for us for the last six years. If you are a small to mid-sized business in any industry, Squarespace is the place to go for all of your website needs. Hop over to www.squarespace.com slash hue for a free trial. And if you like what you see and want to move forward, receive 10% off your first order by using the discount code hue at checkout. Thanks, Squarespace. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, join the conversation in the comment section below because this is an exceptional audience. If you'd like help with a portfolio review, gear selection, finding or honing your artistic voice, sign up for a one-on-one -on -one mentoring video call via Zoom at 3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, please consider supporting our work by using the no cost to you affiliate links down below, 
sending us coffee money via PayPal, or most especially joining us on Patreon, links down below as well. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.